right? You guys are all live streaming to the internet. <laughs> Thank you for your implicit consent. Uh, all right, so we're, we're using, we're using uh, some technology right now. If you have a question to ask of the panel, just use hashtag on Twitter, hashtag TomTomFest, and then it will magically appear here, and I will ask it seamlessly, and we'll get your questions answered in real time. All right, panelists, first and foremost, can you make the elevator pitch for your city and startups? Let's start this way. In no particular order. Let's start this way so I can think about it. Uh, sure, I've been based in DC for the last two years, so Don and I may have a similar one, or, or maybe different, but um, DC is seen as kind of a stodgy political town. You think of House of Cards as opposed to Silicon Valley if you're gonna compare it to a show, but it's, really on the rise if you look in the past two years in terms of venture capital funding, in terms of different programs and initiatives like 1776, um, and just the general awareness of a robust startup ecosystem emerging in DC. Um, I think it's really on the rise and we have the benefit of having the government there as opposed to a deterrent. Great, well that's actually a good segue. So I, I, I would agree with that, DC is on the rise. Uh, if you think about Washington, DC, I mean, first of all, just in terms of the capital, right? It's a city, back to the House of Cards reference, that raises, I think it's $4.5 billion every campaign cycle, right? So it knows how to raise money. Five of the 10 wealthiest counties in the nation, and we have all of the world's institutions, the world's leaders come to town, uh, the embassies, the trade groups, all the associations, all corporations. You've got K Street, like it or love it, which is one phone call away from any powerful person you would want to know in the world. So we have all of the ingredients to be a key player in tomorrow's economy when literally tech and digitization and internet comes to every industry and challenges every industry structure, which oh, by the way, means every regulatory structure. So if you're a startup tackling any industry, you're gonna run headlong into those challenges and DC is a great place to be. Richmond has gone through a dramatic transformation over the last few centuries from where we grew things and made things to what I call a transformation into thinking of things. Richmond's a great place. It's a cool city, but we focused with the rise of the uh, creative class 15 years ago, thinking about how do we make Richmond a place that will at be attractive to people to come to Richmond, and I think we've, made a, we've come a long way and we're headed in the right direction. We've got a lot of cool places to live and work, and we're remarkably fortunate, the fact that we have a lot of places that the old making things factories have been reconverted into cool apartments and fantastic workplaces, great restaurants, and even a microbrewery or two. In addition to that, we're really working hard to form the capital. One of the things that we want to commit to Richmond entrepreneurs, we never ever want you to have to leave Richmond to find capital in Atlanta, New York, or other places. We want to make sure that we've got the early funders there and the growth, and the growth stage funding to en enable you to take a scalable business and a solid business plan and be able to grow that and be supported by Richmond, both from a point of view professionally, financially, and otherwise. And we just have, a, a, I think, a lot of interesting things going on, whether it's the river or the 15, uh, the 15 international bike races going on. It's a great place to raise a family. It's a great place to start a business. It's a great place to live and work and play. Well, New York, if, if you make it there, you'll make it anywhere. <laughs> but it's really cheap. I think that's a real good thing, right? Uh, uh, just kidding. Um, uh, New York's great because of, for me, the business development opportunities. There's so many businesses there, so if you're selling products, selling advertising, New York's great. It's also incredibly, I think it's the most accessible point in terms of startup hubs to Europe, and that can be important for businesses as well. All right. Now, we're going to make this case for Charlottesville. <laughs> so, so I'm curious, right? We got a lot of people here who are very interested in Seville as a hub for this kind of innovation. Is or what is the role of government in helping encourage that? I'll, I'll start. So I think you used the right word, mm -hmm. encourage, mm -hmm. right? Um, we all have read the studies, I assume Kaufman and many others have put them out about the connection between entrepreneurship and jobs. So everybody I've met in government in the last five years gets that. They just 
Many of them aren't really sure how to do it, but they're the people who have the time and the money and the motivation to build that community. So they are often the people who step up to try to do it, but they are not the right people to do it. Right? Their role is to be the champion, to be the cheerleader, to be a potential convener, but the entrepreneurs themselves and the community as a whole has to step up to do it. Bottom up, collaborative, you know, let's you have to define a vision of what does the community have that is not being utilized, that if we all pulled together, we could put it to work and then get the community connected into other communities so that when you have an entrepreneur who wants to build their business, they aren't constrained by who lives in a you know 20 block radius around them, but the entire sort of global community can help them. But it's got to, it has to be entrepreneur led. The politicians, the government, they, they constantly change over. Agendas are driven by political interest and entrepreneurship is not a four year cycle, right? It is a long term thing. Building a startup community is a long term thing and the entrepreneurs themselves no, I mean, you all know, if I were to sit and ask you, what are the challenges your community has? What are the things you wish you had as resources? You know, you know the answers, right? But, but you've never been anointed. Everybody's waiting for economic development to fix it. You all, we all have to fix it. Uh, well, I, I just, one quick point for me is I, I think gov cities need to create uh, an environment that encourages I guess, builders to want to stay there and build something. Uh, and I think governments can play a role there. So if you, someone was just mentioning outside, there's this great juice company, I, I forget the name of it, it's, it's a local Charlottesville one. Do you guys remember it? I don't know. Uh, we were enjoying it upstairs, but she chose to stay here and build her business in Charlottesville. And I was just thinking, man, that's really important for the city. And that's something the government should pay close attention to constantly. And if she needs access to warehousing or you know, materials or better access to farming for her products, that can be where the government says, you stay here, we'll take care of a lot of these things to be very helpful. And the more that you can do that and keep people wanting to build in, in Charlottesville, that'll really help it become a, a hub for sure. Just to put, uh, hook onto that point, I do believe there's a role for government in a public-private partnership so that you have some developers and local governments and state governments working together to form a public-private partnership for places like accelerators, for programs, and some other things. I believe one of the things that's really unique about Richmond and Charlottesville and Roanoke and others is already a public-private partnership. You know, one of the things that gr that's really attractive about these communities is we have fantastic old warehouses, old manufacturing sites that have been, now been turned into apartments and restaurants and other things. Without the historic tax credits, it would really been difficult to do. Virginia is remarkable in the fact that every dollar a developer spends for renovation of a place like this 45 cents of it is sheltered through Virginia historic tax credits and federal tax credits. Richmond wouldn't be what it is, neither would Charlottesville, neither would Roanoke without those kind of programs. Now, that's a little bit different kind of uh, government involvement or support, but I think that kind of infrastructure really is important, and anything we do needs to be, as you, as you said, a grounds up public-private partnership. But can I just say something to that, since it's a panel and we wanted to sort of dive right in? I mean. The, I think all of those things are fantastic. They're necessary. You want to create the right petri dish, if you will, so that things actually grow. Um, but what we have seen over the last, I mean, I, I saw it through Startup America, and I've seen it as I visited, you know, literally hundreds of ecosystems in the last two years. We stop there, right? We stop at the conditions, and we don't really get to the part where we're actively creating outcomes, right? Just getting the tax credits, just getting the regulatory framework in place. Like, how many entrepreneurs in this room started their business because the tax credits were right? Right? Like, it's important, it's absolutely necessary, it's important that it gets done, but that isn't the big lever, right? The big levers are the things that the community can do. Building density, having the people who are the successful entrepreneurs actually spend time and be accessible to the entrepreneurs. Mentoring, uh, the companies in the community being willing to buy from the entrepreneurs. The governor being able to showcase the successful company like the juice company, which I wish I knew the name of because I, I would go it buy is it. Lumi, Lumi Juice. Lumi Juice, shout hey. out to Lumi Juice. Shout out to whoever Are you here? That. Where are you? Are you here at Bounder? delicious. We loved it. Yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right, they need to be a facilitator. Brad Feld wrote his book on startup communities and it's all about how everything has to be entrepreneurship driven. It has to be the entrepreneurs that are creating that. Um, 
But from an infrastructure standpoint, we've seen in DC as well, things like having a new metro line has opened up a totally new tech corridor that was kind of distanced from downtown DC. So there's certain things like that that can be important. And at the same time, um, kind of traditional economic development groups, the chambers and things like that, I think there's a certain role that they can play from connecting young entrepreneurs in a mentorship capacity to some of their more traditional longstanding members as well. Real, real yeah. quick, I want to dive in here because, so Seville is an interesting place um, because, right, if, if someone were, I'm mean, thinking back to my mobile menu, like starting a company here, I had some advisors through the university, I had some advisors in the community, um, didn't have access to a ton of capital. I mean, there are, there are rich people here, but like angel investors, right, the kind of people who want to write a $50,000 check and say, yeah, go ahead, good luck with your internet startup. Not as many of them here. Um, how, how do you, how do you stay here while also, like, is it, is it, is it just take the fundraising trips, go out to DC, go out to New York, go out to the bigger markets, the Valley, take their money and come back. And, and how do you reconcile that with needing to spend all your time building your company or at least most of it? Well, one of the things that we have been doing at Richmond Ventures is focusing on the geographic area. So mm. we, you're writing provide, checks. We, we do. Um, and we cover Central Virginia. So oh. Charlottesville is part of our, our, uh, our area. We think that this is a tremendous area. We'll talk a little bit later on, I guess, about universities. Mm -hmm. But there's an important role for this community to play in supporting that. And I think there's an important role that Richmond plays, not in making looking at Charlottesville or Williamsburg as a satellite, but as a real partner in entrepreneurship. Well, I think some of it takes time, too. If you look at an ecosystem and try to build up clusters, and through the life cycle of an entrepreneur, the idea is that you build a great company, you exit that company, and then you kind of fertilize the economy by investing in more. And we've seen it in certain um, you know, industries in DC, and it takes time to build out those clusters and have those successful exits and things like that. Yeah, the, the other thing is um, you know, getting connected even beyond the local community. Um, so we're, we have a partnership with UVA. We have entrepreneurs from this area all the time in Washington, DC. We're always welcome and interested in coming here. Uh, the other thing is, if you look at the wealth, you mentioned there's money here, but they're not writing checks. Right? If you spend the time to do the analysis of what, what are those wealthy people doing with their money? What are their philanthropy interests? Uh, have they invested in venture? Because we were, we were I was surprised. So I, I had my first entrepreneurial experiences in the entrepreneurial hotbed of downtown Detroit. And as we, I sort of echoed the same, there's no money here, no one's writing checks here, because they weren't. But when I looked at the community and I was talking with a number of the wealthy people in the community, they actually were writing angel and early stage checks. They were writing checks to organizations like Kleiner Perkins and Dahl Capital and Axel Ventures because they didn't realize that entrepreneurship was happening in their own community and that they could actually play a role. There, no one had ever unlocked that money, right? So like that is, a, that is something that is really important for the community to say, we're gonna make a commitment to at least making sure that the people who have the wealth know there are opportunities, because uh, they can't invest in what they don't know exists. So that's everyone's job here. Ask your rich friends in Charlottesville who own medical practices or practice law to keep their eyes open for some really exciting young startups. I, I had a dental appointment yesterday. Uh, fortunately for you all, otherwise I would have been on stage with a missing front tooth. Uh, Charlottesville's own Lee Family Dentistry is, is the reason I've got this smile on stage today. But he asked me about investing, believe it or not, in startups. He has no clue, no awareness, no accessibility to it. Uh, I'm one of the few people that gives him that accessibility. But clearly just by him asking, and I didn't, and I didn't even think to ask him, uh, there is interest out there and there is plenty of wealth in Charlottesville. So again, hopefully some of the takeaways here for the audience is how you can help make Charlottesville uh, a startup hub, and one is, again, asking your rich friends to open up their pocketbooks a little bit. Yeah, I mean, some of it's awareness. I mean, that's our job as media, is to be kind of a voice of those communities. I think the odds that, in, you know, in D.C., you walk down the street and someone knows about startups, knows that there's this growing ecosystem, knows that 1776 exists, is much greater than it was even 12 months ago. Um, and those are the people that are your potential clients, and, those are your users, those are the people you need to get feedback from. Right? Yeah. You actually have to recognize that 
like when we think about celebration, right? All, all of you who run companies, you, you do your own PR, you're trying to publicize your company. But who is actually publicizing the collection of all of you, right? Because right now it's one plus one plus one equals three. Right? How do you make one plus one plus one equal 12? Right? And is there a way to amplify that locally so people who are already here know, hey, I actually could invest in those cool companies. Um, and also so the students know, if I'm entrepreneurial curious, I could go work in those companies or I could start my company here instead of moving. Right? It turns out that celebration is so key to unlocking a lot of that in the community. Just one final point. I, I think. For example, we're not a fund, but we have 50 individuals who are likewise committed to making a difference in their community and supporting entrepreneurs who are making a difference in the world. So it's a, it's a big difference in being able to have a network and engaging individuals who have the wherewithal and the passion as much as the entrepreneurs do to work in, in investing. And so we try to figure out ways in which the investors not just support with capital, but support with mentoring, coaching, and, and get involved to really know what that company is doing and be a cheerleader, not just for the companies, but for Richmond and Central Virginia. What, what kind of role do you think the University of Virginia should have in trying to help this community? You know, we focus a whole lot on education, and I, I think it's probably worth a really quick um, mention of what we do so you guys know why we might be authorities in the space, because everybody here uh, was chosen for their respective roles in, I guess, in, in helping communities. At Uncubed, we, uh, our biggest community-based, I guess, um, product is, is a conference called the Uncubed Conference, which we do in a number of different cities. We've done one in Boston and Philadelphia. Uh, New York, SF, Chicago, Los Angeles, and we've learned, uh, you know, a little bit about all of these different communities and what helps them thrive, uh, and that's why I've been asked to speak about it, because of, of our intimacy and knowing that, as well as Berlin and London, so we know a little bit overseas. As far as universities and how universities can help, um, there's a lot of, uh, it's, it, there's a, it, you know, education's under a critical eye right now, I'm sure a lot of you are, are aware of that, are we graduating people with degrees that matter, are we graduating people with um, the skills that are actually in demand, what have you. But I do believe the university's role is to pay attention to uh, what's evolving in this world in general because it's their job to educate people into these careers. And for University of Virginia to be really helpful in this, it's to graduate talent that will build things, that will create things, and to be, pay attention to that so that the curriculum uh, at the university uh, is relevant to building things and supporting it in that way and uh, not having uh, you know, these, these big tech, tech transfer offices that are so complicated for people to navigate through if they want to build something on campus. Like, make it a little bit easier for people to build things and support it. You know, one thing that I, I heard, and Alexis, you might know this uh, better than I am, let me know if I'm lying when I say this, because I thought I heard this, that when Facebook launched their kind of app marketplace or what have you, Stanford immediately created a class called like Facebook Apps and graduated seven millionaires because they built like these popular apps. That's a school that's just paying attention, and I think that's something that schools can learn from and continue to grow, and UVA is now expanding its entrepreneurship program with David Tuvey, who's on stage, pay attention to that, because really good things are gonna hopefully come, come from it. Yeah, I mean, startups and you know, high-growth companies are the future of our economy, and so universities need to start paying attention to that and training people with those skills. And we were talking backstage, not one of us had a major that was remotely related to anything we're doing right now. Um, so, schools are starting to wake up, and understand that entrepreneurship can be taught. Um, and I think it needs to be a holistic approach across the university. It can't just be a program where you can take classes at the business school on entrepreneurship. It needs to be something that's a holistic approach because if you're a business school student, your co-founder may be a medical student because you're starting a healthcare company, those type of things. Yeah, and, I, and there's two layers to it as well. I mean, I think what, what my fellow panelists have said is excellent. It, it's not just about getting people to start companies, it's also about getting people to understand the entrepreneurial mindset, right? Because the way our economy is moving, uh, our economy used to be very top-down, hierarchical, bureaucratic. When you graduated college, it was all about getting into a you know, Fortune 500 company and working your way up the ladder. And that isn't the case anymore, right? The average number of jobs that a, a student will have in their lifetime, I think it's like, I don't know, it's it's definitely in the double digits, if not into the 20, right? So it is now a place where you're in charge of your portfolio career. You'll have all sorts of jobs. You have to be collaborative and transparent and open and malleable and flexible, right? So that is a whole different set of skill sets to teach. Um, we've, we have found, we have a, a, 
we, we track a lot of data about our members, and one of the pieces of data we track is their level of college education and where they went. And we have a very well-educated group of entrepreneurs. We have 285 members in our community, 285 companies, about 600 entrepreneurs. And what we found when we first launched, you know, we went, raced across Washington, D.C. and got all these wonderfully smart, well-connected power players to come in and spend time with the members to do office hours. We curated a bunch of classes to get them going. Set a giant buffet of resources. One of the best, we think, sort of high-quality resources you could ever have as an entrepreneur. And most of our members didn't know what to do with it, right? Because they haven't been taught the actual skill of how do you navigate the day-to-day -to, -day to take something from idea to scale, much like the story you were telling in your founder story, right? Like, turns out we can teach a lot of that based on your experiences. You just shared it. How do we programmatize that? How do we teach it? It has to be much less about business plans and business plan competitions and more so about what is it actually like? How do you actually do it? What's the process that others that have done it have followed? And, and then connecting people to help you navigate that. Could I have two quick hook-ons to that? Uh, one, University of Virginia, along with William and & Mary and, and VCU, attract a tremendous number of out-of-state students to come to, to the school here. And then one of the roles that we have as part of this ecosystem is to let them know what a great place this is, not just to come learn, but to come and live and start a business. And, and so being very focused on letting people know that yeah, we have a lot of things to be taught and be learned here and can start a business, but we need to make sure that they understand through whether it's uh, bringing more students here, bringing them to Richmond, letting them know about the power of Central Virginia and what we after and how we can help them grow their businesses. One other point, I think, is sort of the university beyond the walls. And that is getting the faculty, at, particularly at UVA, to spend some time with other faculty at some of the other universities. You know, unfortunately, just as you were saying, the, the focus in what's really what we measure for success has changed. So it's not so much about writing business plans as it is helping develop a sustainable business model. And we have a lot of students in other universities and, frankly, some faculty, too, who could, who could really gain some insight from spending time together and having the faculty coach and mentor each other and really know what's going on in the startup community and how they can add value outside of the university walls. And, and it's clear how much of a difference getting it right will make because as you all have hinted and, or even explicitly said, like, the people who have the skills in this age to succeed technologically are going to be leaps and bounds over those who don't in this new economy. And what is the responsibility for us, and this question has come up quite a bit, um, what's the responsibility for us as we build these communities to make sure that they are inclusive of gender, race, class? This is, uh, and I'm hopping on this quickly because this is something that you know, I think about all the time. It comes up so often in conversations amongst my peers, both professionally and personally, and it's this um, socioeconomic divide which creates, uh, unfortunately, an intellect divide, and it is a growing one, um, where new, new economy technology, new economy education is uh, being consumed by uh, a, a white you know, population for the most part, and just, you know, the, the quicker we are to grasp new economy skills and new economy technology, the, the greater we're going to accelerate. Uh, meanwhile, there is an unbelievable group of individuals that don't even know it exists. So the accessibility is a big problem, but the awareness is a big problem also. Uh, and so it's something that I hope, you know, with, with focusing on social good and these other companies that um, we as entrepreneurs, as founders, as community, you know, leaders, focus on and it's how can we make this more accessible to people and how can we make it how can we increase the awareness i i could could not agree more as a person who is usually one of the only in tech related events um you it mean, is definitely you mean woman right yeah i do mean woman <laughs> yes well i mean what i'm what i mean by that is right because we have a gender disparity but and we, also we also have a racial, racial one yep and totally in, in a city like dc how, how can we work to rectify that? Yeah, it's, it is an enormous issue. Uh, so right after 1776 launched, uh, there, uh, 
DC administration brought together leaders from across the tech community to sit down and talk about where were we all going collectively and how do we create a stronger innovation economy, which I applaud and I think it was a phenomenal gathering and it was a great minds in the room and we were having really great conversation. Right up until one person in the room said, we, we came up against this issue of how do we make this inclusive and one person said, look, I, I convened this big event, we've got big spaces and they're just not coming and I figure that if you're interested in it, you will come, right? That's the issue, right? Like we can't just assume if you build it, they'll come because they don't even know it's there because they don't, no one's ever told them that's something they should think about, right? And even when they come, they're the only person in the room usually and so it, it creates a vicious cycle where, where we don't have full engagement, right? And at the same time, we're missing out on skill set, amazing ideas, smart people. So we have, to, we have to really stop and ask ourselves, have I actually spent time in all parts of the city? Right? DC is divided into wards. Have I actually spent time in all the wards of Washington, DC? No, I, I hang out by you know, DuPont Circle, which by the way is mostly white, mostly wealthy, mostly young. Right? We as leaders have to stop ourselves and say, I have to actually act differently to solve the problem, right? And so we're, we spend a lot of time on this. We're piloting an initiative um, with a number of partners in DC to actually um, give scholarships to people from the wards that are not well represented to get them trained, get them into the community. We've partnered, we've done a tremendous, we spent a tremendous amount of time on outreach, but also just being thoughtful about who you put on stage, who are the entrepreneurs that you showcase, right? We, we ask ourselves every single time, is this well-balanced and well-represented, right? Because we have failed if the only people who get to meet the President of the United States when he comes to 1776 are the white dudes. Yep, I mean, I, I, think, I think it needs to be consistent, and to your point, I mean, um, there are a lot of one-time events where maybe we honor 10 female entrepreneurs and we bring them up on the stage and we give them a plaque and that's great. But it's much more valuable if that female entrepreneur, to use Donna's example, is then mentoring someone else throughout the course of the year, is telling her story as opposed to just being honored for being one of the few that, that is successful in that field. And so building up things that are consistently happening and we're starting to see whether it's teaching girls to code or different STEM groups and things like that, that we're gonna to start to reap the rewards later on in terms of diversity, um, but it needs to be a consistent initiative as opposed to just one time thing. Yeah. Can I just what? say something to that? Please stop the let's just cordon the women off into their own thing, right? I, I know it's well-intentioned, but let's just integrate the women, right? I was gonna just, just remark one thing too. I, I think a number of, of communities are looking at this from the point of view of how do we uh, let our high school students and middle school students get more aspirational, learn about the fact that career doesn't mean that you go to work at some factory the way your dad or your parents did or your grandparents did. It's to st start a spark of entrepreneurship and the STEM programs that a lot is uh, pushed at the state does have an entrepreneurial aspect to it, and I would hope that we as entrepreneurs would care as much about going into the schools and talking about what we do and giving them encouragement, particularly the urban city schools, so that we can find out those students who have a spark that aspire and want to make a difference in the community and somehow be a difference in someone's life. And hopefully you learn from this that not to let government solve this problem. That's right. No, no, no. To be solved by... Yeah, man. You know, donate some time. I mean, there are some great nonprofits. I'm thinking of a few, particularly in D.C., that are focused on teaching entrepreneurship. So they take successful business people and teach kids from at-risk, you know, backgrounds who would not have, they don't have the ability to set up a lemonade stand. You know, even if their bottom line is $5.50, they've never had that experience of controlling a bottom line and selling something, and they're giving them the opportunity to do that. So pay attention. There may be opportunities to do that, or in Charlottesville to, to launch your own something. Could I make just one more point in that as a shout out to a couple of our entrepreneurs who are starting incubators for uh, small businesses? Because that's really where we see a lot of diversity opportunities, both in entrepreneurship for scalable businesses, but also opportunities for small businesses. And we have BizWorks and some others who are focusing on helping 
um, people in the urban area who, who have business ideas, help them uh, get that idea up into a business model, give them training. It's a three-month program, and we are really enthusiastic about that because it's, a, it's sort of a pipeline from starting with, with people who wouldn't normally think about starting their business. It's helping them start and then think about, is this a scalable business? And if so, how can we help them grow it even more? A number of you touched on education, and, and I do want to point out, there's at least one history major also in the room who has since tweeted at me. I, I am grateful for my history major, and I, I know you all have other random majors that have nothing to do with your jobs too, but hopefully there was, I, I believe that there was value there as well in different ways. Um, and yet at the same time, I think about the practical skills I needed to do what I do and a lot of those were just, I was just lucky to be self-taught and to have friends who were interested in programming. Um, what's our responsibility from an education standpoint to try to build curricula that are going to prepare students to not just be well-rounded citizens, but also get jobs? And, and how can we, I mean, this is a huge issue, obviously, but, but solve it in the next five minutes. <laughs> I mean, some of the things that I'm seeing that I like, uh, University of Virginia, I was, to be fair, I was so anti-University of Virginia as an entrepreneur for a very long time because I thought they honestly didn't give a shit about entrepreneurship or supporting. When I really reached back to the school to help me with my first business, I didn't even get, I didn't get a no, which would have been nice because my favorite answer is yes, my second's no, my least favorite is nothing or maybe. Uh, and that's what I kept getting from the school. But as students have really taken the reins and ownership of their career, which we were never taught to do, we were never taught to actually take ownership of our career, by the way. We were just kind of taught to be like, but you know, do what the school kind of instructs you to and, and, and what have you. It's a much longer conversation, but now people are starting to say like, I can be a life learner, I can take, you know, I can take ownership of my career. Uh, I'm seeing UVA students do that. Hacksieville really helped start that. And Daniel Wilson who helped organize this yeah, and other bravo. people. Yeah. Bravo, bravo. Round of applause for Hacksieville for sure. But we're, this, you know, a gentleman named Kyle Bai who now works at Foursquare, these are kids that have started to take ownership of their own careers and asking folks like Alexis and myself up in New York to help them like, better engage with startups in New York, which we've done. Now over 100 UVA students come up to New York and are participating in the startup world. And now the University of Virginia pay, starts to pay attention. Uh, they hire David Tuvey, who's doing a great job with entrepreneurship and building out a program. They just got approval for a minor. You're starting to see like things actually change on campus, which I think is, again, led by students. So taking that type of ownership and the school just paying attention to that and, you know, breaking a little bit of that institutional mindset and saying, you know, what, what direction is it going in? Follow it and then support it. Don't ha you don't have to be a leader as the university, but you, you should enable and create an environment for students to do what they want and to learn what it is that they want uh, and then help incubate it on campus. There's literally no better place to build something than on a college campus. Most of you don't have like a shitload of bills to really worry about. There's so many smart people around you. There's so many resources. Professors are amazing, you know, mentors uh, and and, and creating like an environment for people to build things is great. I mean, Alexis came together with Steve and they built something. Steve was in an engineering school. You were e e history. history, but oh, yeah. you I'll, took classes in McIntyre. I, I went to McIntyre too. <laughs> so, you know, I, pro I once proposed like six years ago to UVA. I said, why don't you try to cr like take a semester project that combines McIntyre with the engineering school and encourages these builders and these, you know, business, business development minds to come together. And the response at the time was, no, because McIntyre's gonna have to pay for it all because we're the rich school. And I was like, well, there you go. You're never gonna have any entrepreneurs with that type of mindset, but it's starting to change. I, I think those of us who've been involved in higher ed for a long time understand the silos that are there and it's so hard to break those down, but maybe that's the role for us to play, not in breaking them down, but at least spanning silos so that students get a chance to learn some of the skill sets that are really important to being successful entrepreneurs, dealing with difficult problems, constant changing conditions, how do you build a team, how do you focus on, on a, a sustainable business model as opposed to writing a detailed business plan, how do you, how do you really focus on the culture? I, I find that sometimes startups spend too little time thinking about culture and shared values that they want to have in their company and when they start thinking about it, it's a little bit late. And so the, a lot of these soft skills that I really encourage every university to build into the curriculum, just as they do to some of the harder sided uh, topics that they, that they teach. So to, just to quickly build on that, so uh, 
look, my, my dad is very handy. He owns every craftsman tool known to mankind. I can go in his garage and I can pick up any one of those tools. I don't know what the hell to do with them, right? That, that to me is the equivalent of what's going on when we're teaching entrepreneurship, right? We're teaching you what each of the tools are, but we're not teaching you how you actually navigate and do it because it is mostly the personal stuff, right? If you think back to Alexis' comments on, in the beginning, right, it's all about grit and tenacity and, and stick to and when do you stay and when do you go and how do you move through the hard times and how do you know when you're succeeding and how do you navigate change? How do you, drive, how do you be someone who drives that yourself versus sitting back and waiting for someone to drive that for you, right? So the university has to, do, has to teach both of those things if we're going to really be successful. And then the other thing I think is such an underutilized asset in the area of entrepreneurship is the alumni network. The thing that the entrepreneurs need most are connections to people who could be mentors, potential customers, and by the way, potential capital, right? Because there's an enormous alumni network for UVA who lots of successful people out there with jobs and money, that if there was an initiative to get them to do angel investing back in Charlottesville and the UVA community, my guess is that would be really well received, right? So lots of underutilized assets in the university, but we have to really understand how hard it is and what it takes to build companies and the things the entrepreneurs need and what can universities do to help break those barriers down and help solve those problems. Yeah, I think this is consistent with what everyone has said, but. I like to use, I'm a sports guy, so I use sports analogies, but when college football programs recruit, they recruit the top defensive back or the top quarterback, but then there's also athletes, which are people in high school who don't necessarily have a position because they can run fast and they can play four different positions. Colleges need to develop as many athletes as possible as opposed to just an accountant, or just a quarterback, things like that. And that's something we look at when we're hiring is can this person do multiple things? Can they write well? Can they communicate well? Can you put them in front of a client in an important meeting? Can they do these different things as opposed to just coming out with a specific skill set? And we don't have a ton of time left, but I want to I want to think about some things specific to Charlottesville. Now, if if you all right, if you all have challenged this audience to do some cool things like you know raise awareness, make sure people know that this is a place to be starting communities for them for starting startups for them to sort of create a kind of startup community. We've shouted out places like Hack Seville, amazing, amazing spots where students can go or just people can go to build things. What community efforts have you seen really, really work? I'm, I'm talking everything from like angel networks to accelerators to meetups, you know, weekly meetups to like, what, what are the things that actually have the best ROI, especially for a smaller town like Charlottesville? One of, the, one of the first things is, is you mentioned Hacksieville, being able to have density, right? So if you, if you wander around downtown here, how do you know where to go if you're entrepreneurial curious or if you want to find out what's going on in the startup community, right? So spaces become really important because then it gets everybody sort of convening and connecting. And then it gives you a platform to overlay education and events and speakers and people like us that want to come to town and mentor startups. Um, and then it also gives you the ability to bring investors in who want to invest in all of those companies. Because it's hard for any one of you to maybe draw those resources, but collectively, if you're all in the same building, a lot easier to get those resources. So that's, that's uh, definitely, I think we've seen very successfully in communities all over the world, a really good starting point to just get the community convened and connected. All right, so we're gonna put Hack Seville everywhere. Right. Hack Seville's in all the things. Right. Okay, right. there you go. Everywhere you walk in Charlottesville, there's gonna be a Hack Seville. The rotunda, Hack Seville. Um, and I, one real life example of, of uh, I believe, what, what, uh, what Donna is um, saying and what we saw with Uncubed is we, we launched a conference in Berlin. We, launched, uh, we tried to launch a conference in London. Um, and uh, what we learned and what I really appreciated is when I first went to London, they, there was this gov sort of government supported initiative called Tech City. Um, and that, it was tough for me, maybe as an American, to understand that Tech City wasn't like a city, it was like an initiative. It was strange, but it was an initiative to develop East London only. And at first I was like, well, that sucks because what if someone in Notting Hill or West London wants to build something and like the government doesn't give a shit. They're like, everything's in the East. 
And so I was like, that's kind of a, I really th felt that was a turnoff and a mistake from uh, a, a PR standpoint and what have you. And it was a very divisive, um, uh, I guess, topic at the time. But then I went to Berlin to prep that. And the good thing about Tech City, it, 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 or what I didn't appreciate at Tech City was, um, I just spent all my time in East London because of that. But when I went to Berlin and we were trying to prep that, that conference, I mean, we were like constantly bouncing all over this big city to these different little areas where there were tech companies and incubators and, VC and, and venture capital firms and startups. There was no cluster. And it was at that moment where I was like, this, I, get why I get tech city now. When I travel, whether you're an investor, uh, you're a speaker, or you're someone that's interested in the market, if you can take a ton of meetings, meet the majority of people, and it's all centered in one cluster, so much more happens there. It's more combustible. And because of that, I mean, it was, for me, it was a much more pleasant and rewarding experience. And I feel like I know that culture or that community uh, significantly more because it was just confined to one cluster. And then it can build out from there. But that was just to, just to kind of piggyback on a real-life point from what Donna was saying. We, we've done some studies of what I call star cities for startups, Nashville, did, um, Denver, Boston areas, and, and you look at their accelerators and you look at some other cities' accelerators, and those cities that have accelerators that are really real estate models, they really don't work very well. What do you mean and by that? Where, where, you, where the city or somebody puts in this and they said, well, in order to be here, this is the rent, so you, you basically have a rental model. Yeah. And, and what happens is you attract the people who can pay the rent, not the people who should be there networking together. So in Richmond, we have three districts. We have um, one downtown, we have one over in Scott's Edition, one, out, one across the, the bridge in Manchester. But what we do not have is what you talked about. We do not have a place, a front door yet, for people to come and be able to say, yes, this is where we can meet. We have a lot of urban farmhouse coffee houses, but we don't have a place for really being able to attract and put Richmond on the map and I hope that Charlottesville can look at that same way and figure it, perhaps, perhaps you do have it, perhaps you don't have it, but it needs to be very broad and understood by the community. And I think you need some leaders who are willing to beat the drum and kind of stick their neck out there. Yeah. And if you think about a community's mission, and you know, it's a long process and you need some influential people to really get behind it, um, whether that's for their network or just you know, their knowledge and mentorship and things like that. I think you know, we have publications in Boston, DC, Chicago, and are going to Austin and Denver and Nashville soon. And all of those markets have you know, certain figureheads in those communities who have given their time, their money, and all of their resources into helping build an ecosystem because it does help everybody involved. You do realize this means that Biltmore is going to have to convert to a tech <laughs> headquarters. Coops is going to convert to a tech headquarters. That's, how, that's what has to happen, guys. Your bars have to go. <laughs> that's right. I mean, Little John, you notice sorry, they're very not. uneasy it's about that. So, <laughs> that is actually such an important point. Living in Michigan, you know, there were two communities Basically, the size, and they looked a lot like what you have here in, in town. You know, beautiful, sort of small town feel. Ann Arbor and Birmingham, right? Equal levels of wealth, but if you look at what happened in those two communities, Ann Arbor's startup community, like this. Birmingham startup community, like this, right? Nothing going on. Right? And why is that? Well, if you go to downtown Ann Arbor on any day and you have breakfast at Cafe Zola, you will run into every single venture capitalist, all the major angel investors and the successful entrepreneurs because they are open and accessible and you know how to find them, right? So it doesn't have to be a co-working space or a campus or an incubator or an accelerator. It can just be a coffee shop. In Birmingham, where are those same people? They're at the country club, right? That, has to, that model has to change. Well, just, just to, when I at a point, we, we've uh, sponsored a study and if you'd like to <laughs> get a copy of that about the ecosystem, feel free to go to our website. But we've tried to identify eight things that are really important to a community for an ecosystem. And, and I think what we're trying to do in Richmond, and we've had our city leaders and business leaders and entrepreneur, entrepreneurs, and we're looking at them and say, where are we really good and where are we not so good? And, and so that's been sort of the game plan so that everyone is using the same vernacular and everyone is using the same ecosystem that we're gonna work toward. And I would encourage uh, Charlottesville leaders and others because you're right, it takes a few people with the foresightedness to say, we're committed to making a difference and we're gonna do it through entrepreneurship in our community. All right, you have your marching orders, Charlottesville. Uh, please thank all of our wonderful panelists.
Big thank you to Paul Beyer, Daniel Wilson, and the whole Tom Tom Fest crew. Yeah. Unbelievably impressive with this, guys. Everybody, job Absolutely. well done. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Thank you uh, you've much. got your leaders. See you all at Hack Seville. <laughs>